Dependency injection and service containers are terms you'll come across when learning frameworks like Laravel and Symfony. In this video, you'll learn what dependency injection is and why it makes coding and testing much easier. To do this, we'll build a simple service container from scratch so you can see exactly how it works. Let's start with this code. Here we have a file called database.php containing a database class. In here we have four properties for the database host, database name, username and password. There's one public method which connects to the database using PDO and returns a PDO object. In a file called repository.php we have a repository class which has a single public method called getAll. This creates a new database object, calls the getConnection method on it, then uses that connection object to query the product table in the database, returning all rows as associative arrays. These two classes are in a folder called source. I've configured Composer's autoloader to load all the class files from that folder. Finally, we have an index.php script in the web root. In here, we're requiring Composer's autoloader, creating a new repository object, then calling the getAll method on that, and using vardump to print out the return value. The database the code connects to already contains some sample data. If we run this code by opening index.php in a browser, we see these database rows printed out. So what is a dependency? A dependency is basically an object that another object depends on. In this example, the repository class depends on a database object in order for it to work. In other words, the repository class has a dependency of a database object. At the moment, we're creating a database object directly inside the repository class. The problem with this is that this class is now tightly coupled to the database class. If we want to use a different class instead of this one, we have to change the code in here. Also, if we want to unit test this class, we need the database class available, so we can't easily test this class in isolation. To fix this, what we need to do is create a database object elsewhere and pass it to this object. This is known as dependency injection. So let's add the constructor method to this class with an argument of a database object. I'll promote this to a private property. Then in the getAll method, let's remove the line where we create a new database object and on the next line, use the database property instead. In the index.php script, before we create the repository object, let's create a database object and pass this to the repository object constructor. When we run this, it still works as before. Now, however, we're injecting this dependency into the repository object. This is all dependency injection is. Any dependencies are passed to an object instead of that object creating them directly. You can, of course, inject multiple dependencies using this technique. For example, this class might also depend on a mailer or a logger object. Note that in addition to using the constructor method like this, you can also use setter methods and properties, although using the constructor is most common. Back in the index script, when we create the repository object, we have to pass in the required dependencies. This means we have to explicitly create these objects first. To help us do this, let's create a dependency injection container. This is simply a class that will help us to inject dependencies. So let's create a new file in the source folder called container.php, and in here we'll add the PHP opening tag and the class definition. As with the other classes in this video, I'm keeping it as simple as possible and not including any namespaces. Let's add a public function called get with a string argument for the class name, and this will return an object. Inside this method, we want to create an object of the specified class. So for now, let's just create an object using the new keyword and return it. Back in the index script, let's check this works by using it to create an object of the database class. So before the line where we're already doing that, let's create an object of the container class. Then, instead of creating the database object with the new keyword, let's call the get method on the container object 
passing in the name of the database class. Note that if the database class was in a namespace, you'd include that as part of the fully qualified class name. When we run this, it still works as before. Note that instead of using a literal string for the class name, it's common to use the class constant instead. Doing this will help with things like auto-completion and automated code checking in some IDEs. Next, let's see what happens if we use the container to create an object of the repository class. Now when we run this, we get an argument count error. Too few arguments to the repository class constructor. This is as expected. The repository class's constructor method requires a database argument. In the container, when we create the object in the get method, we aren't passing anything to the constructor. So before we create this object in here, we need to determine if its constructor has any arguments, and create those objects first. We can do that using reflection. The various reflection classes in PHP allow us to examine the structure of the code itself. So in the container, at the top of the get method, let's create a new reflection class object, passing in the class name. This class reports information about a class. We can see if the class has a constructor with the getConstructor method. For now, let's just print that variable out to see what it contains. Now when we run this, we still get the too few arguments error, but before that, we get two values printed out. Null, and then a reflection method object. We can see that this object refers to the constructor method of the repository class. If we go back to the index file, we can see that the null value is coming from when we call the get method for the database class. This class has no constructor, so the getConstructor method returns null. So in the get method back in the container, instead of printing this out, if the constructor is null, we can return an object of the specified class using the new keyword as we were doing before. If the constructor isn't null, we can get its parameters using the getParameters method. Let's print that out to see what it contains. Now when we run this, we get an array with one element of the reflection parameter class, and we can see its name is database. This name is the name of the parameter to the repository class's constructor. Back in the container, instead of printing out this array of parameters, let's loop around them and inside the loop, use the getType method on each parameter to get its type, and we'll print that out. Let's run this again, and now we get an object of the reflection named type class. The getType method can return various values null if there is no type declaration, or different classes depending on the type declaration used. We can only create classes if it's a reflection named type object, and it's not a built-in type like a string. However, as this is a simple example, I won't complicate this by checking for these different types. Instead, let's cast the type to a string to see what we get. Now when we run this, we get a string containing the type declaration of the argument, which in this case is the database class. To demonstrate this working with additional constructor arguments, let's add another argument to the repository class's constructor for an object of the date time class. When we run this now, we get that class name printed out as well. So this will work for any number of constructor arguments. For now, let's just have the database object. So now in the container, we can create objects of these classes. Before we do that, before the loop, let's initialize an empty array to contain these objects. Then inside the loop, instead of printing out the type, we'll use this very same method to get an object of that class. We'll append this to the array. We use the get method instead of the new keyword, so that if these objects have any dependencies, those will be created automatically too. This will work for any level of objects that have dependencies, where these have dependencies as well, and so on. This is known as an object graph. After the loop, let's print out the dependencies array to see what it contains. <laughs> 
When we run this now, we get an array with one element, which is an object of the database class. So now we have the dependencies. All we need to do is create a new object of the specified class, passing those dependencies to the constructor. So instead of printing this out, we'll create a new object with the new keyword, unpacking the array of dependencies into a list of arguments using the three dots or splat operator. Then we can return this object from this method. And now when we run this, it works as it did originally, printing out the data from the database. If we go to the index script, we can now delete this line where we're creating the database object. When we use the container to create the repository object, this creates its dependencies automatically. This is known as auto wiring. And this still works as before. So the container will automatically create any dependencies that are objects injected using the constructor method. Let's see what happens when a constructor has arguments that aren't objects. Here in the database class, the database connection details are hard coded as properties. Clearly you wouldn't do this in a production application. Instead, these details would be stored in a configuration file and you'd typically pass them in in the constructor method. So let's add the constructor method with arguments with the same name and visibility as the existing properties. We can then remove these properties. As the constructor arguments will be promoted to private properties of the same name, we don't need to make any changes to where we use these properties in the getConnection method. If we run this now, it no longer works, and we get an error from the container saying the class string does not exist. This is because the container will try and create an object based on the type declaration of each constructor argument. The database class constructor is expecting strings, not objects, so we get an error. Let's modify the container so we can specify how to create a specific class if it has dependencies that aren't simple objects. Dependencies like this are commonly known as services, and the container is known as a service container. So at the top of the container class, let's add a private array property called registry that has a default value of an empty array. Then let's add a new public method called set, which will have a string argument for the name of the service, a closure argument for its value, and it won't return anything. If you're not familiar with the closure class, it's just a class that's used to represent anonymous functions. Inside this method, we'll add an element to the registry property using the name as the key and the value for the value. Then in the index, after we create the container object, Let's call the set method we just added using the database class name for the name of the entry we want to add. For the value, we'll pass in an anonymous function. Inside this function, we'll create a new object of the database class, passing in the constructor arguments. The strings that are the database host, name, username and password. Back in the container, in the get method, if a value exists in the registry for a class, we can return that instead of proceeding to the auto wiring code. So at the top of the get method, let's see if the registry array property contains an element with the key of the class name. If so, we can call that value as it's a function and return its return value directly. Now when we run this, it works as before, returning the database data. So the service container we just developed will create any simple dependencies automatically using auto wiring. And if we have any classes that have dependencies that can't be resolved automatically, we can add an entry that tells the container how to do it. This is exactly how the service containers in frameworks like Laravel and Symfony work, and also third party containers like PHPDI. So instead of creating your own, I recommend using one of these as it will have many more features and will have been thoroughly tested. Let's see how the code we just wrote works with PHPDI. First, let's install it using Composer on the command line. We're already using Composer's autoloader, so the package's classes will be loaded automatically. Let's comment out the code that uses our bespoke container class. Then let's create an object of the container class which is in the DI namespace. 
Then, to add service definitions, one way is to pass an associative array to the container's constructor. We'll use the database class name for the key, and an anonymous function that creates a database object for the value, just like we did in our bespoke container class. The phpdi container object has a get method just like the container class that we built, so the next line of code will work as before without any changes. So now when we run this, it still works as before. Now however, the phpdi container is taking care of the service we defined and the auto wiring to create the dependencies automatically. PHPDI has a lot more functionality in addition to what we just saw, so I encourage you to check it out in the official documentation. There's a link to all the source code shown in this video in the description, along with links to sites shown and relevant documentation. Please don't forget to like, comment and subscribe, and as always, thank you for watching.